to you. You all survived this afternoon. Hope you stayed cool. That's the trick, isn't it? I'm going to give you the night off and let you stay seated. We're going to uh, singing about uh, thankfulness tonight. Give thanks with a grateful heart for what he's done through Jesus Christ our Lord.
hymn text tonight come out of the passage of scripture tonight in Ephesians hymn number 395 God of grace and God of glory all thy people pour thy power sing the first second and last stanzas tonight God of grace and God of No. 
Curtis Chapman song, Open the Eyes of My Heart, but it actually comes out of this passage tonight. Open the eyes of our hearts, Lord. Open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. takes me back to some mighty good things when I was just beginning to learn of the grace of God. What a wonderful thing. Well, good evening. The clock is working tonight, so y'all are off the hook. Yeah, I can make it out, John. I'm so <laughs> He said there's a glare on it, and there is, but I can make it out. I don't have any excuses. If I go into extra innings tonight, it's just because I do, okay? Turn with me to the first chapter of Ephesians, and we are going to conclude, Lord willing, this first chapter this evening by dealing with a prayer that Paul offers up on behalf of the Ephesian Christians. One thing Paul was very careful to do was to pray for these people that he had written to and had been involved with and and uh, been a blessing to, and they had been a blessing to him. And he lifted them up before the throne of grace. And you know the greatest activity that the people of God can be involved in, period, is prayer. Uh, we cannot do anything else for God until we have prayed, and we have prayed the power of God beyond our efforts. And Paul is praying for the church there at Ephesus, so we'll begin reading in verse 15 and go to the uh, end of the chapter this evening. Paul says in verse 15, Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spiritual spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, 
What are the riches of the glory of, of the, his inheritance in the saints? What is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us? who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come, and put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Amen. <laughs> that's, uh, that's quite a prayer. And uh, what he's asking God for on behalf of these beloved people. He says, first of all, there in verse 17, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. He's praying for wisdom, but he's praying for them to have spiritual wisdom. Okay? Uh, Paul lived in a world, and Ephesus was a Greek city. And the Greeks were very famous for and fond of their philosophy, okay? And the word philosophy just simply means the love of wisdom. And uh, the, the, the great philosophers, you, you've heard of them. You read Plato and Aristotle and, and uh, as Dr. Lee used to say, uh, not, he didn't pronounce it Socrates, he called it Socrates. <laughs> But all these were the great philosophers of the day. And uh, they would sit around and they would ponder many minute things. And, uh, you know, they were considered to be the, the wise men of their day. But let me tell you something. The Bible tells us that the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. Okay? And by the same token, the world looks at those of us who are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ and who try to walk in the wisdom of the Lord, and the world calls us foolish. And so what Paul is trying to differentiate here, and I'm very certain that many of those who comprise the church at Ephesus may have come out of that Greek background where philosophy was such a, an important thing. And he's saying, I'm praying that God will give you wisdom, but I want to clarify what kind of wisdom it is. I want you to have spiritual wisdom. And a man can be as, as uh, enlightened as he possibly can be about everything under the sun, but if a man doesn't have an ounce of spiritual wisdom in him, he's still an ignorant man. Because that's what Paul is, is, is basically saying here. I want you to have this spiritual wisdom that comes from God. That's what James is talking about when he writes, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally. In other words, he just opens up the purse and just dumps it all out. He'll give you as much as you can handle. And he does not upbraid you or he does not chide you for asking this of him. And you know what, folks? We'd, we'd be a whole lot better off if in life we, could seek, we would seek more after spiritual wisdom and less of the opinions of mankind. Yeah, you folks, now spiritual wisdom, I'm sorry, you can't Google it. Okay? You can't Google spirit. Yeah. <laughs> I think if you, if you ask Siri, uh, tell me about spiritual wisdom, she'll go, sorry, I can't find that. <laughs> Siri and I have some really good arguments. One of them basically is she doesn't speak Arkansas. Uh, you know, I, I don't get along with her at all, so I just kind of bypass her and type it in. But this doesn't come from any other source. It doesn't come from education. Education is a wonderful thing. I 
I, I, I believe it is. I believe we ought to learn as much as we can about everything that we possibly can so we can be of more use to God in every area and arena of life that we possibly can be. And I, I believe that with all my soul. But folks, spiritual wisdom does not come from books. Spiritual wisdom does not come from asking your buddy what you think his opinion is. Uh, spiritual wisdom comes from God, and it is imparted spiritually to us. There's only one book that I know of that can impart spiritual wisdom, and I'm holding it in my hand right here, and that is the Word of God because it is spiritually inspired. The Holy Spirit inspired the writing of this beloved book that is in my hands right here, and the Bible says that it's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. I've met some folks that um, in my life that have been a real blessing to me. Some of them didn't have much uh, learning at all. I got so tickled. And my, one of my grandsons, my son Nathan, he is, he is my typical country guy. I mean, he's got everyday overalls and he's got Sunday overalls. You know, that's, that's just him. He's got one son named Garrett. When Garrett turned about, uh, about seven, he sent old Garrett over to me. And Garrett was losing. He would lost a couple of his front teeth. And Garrett walked over to me and he said, I ain't got no book learning. <laughs> I've met folks who didn't have a whole lot of that book learning, but they sure knew about life, and they sure knew about God, and they sure knew how to search out the mind and the heart of God. And I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, if there is a knowledge that is vital to us, it is spiritual knowledge. We cannot do without it. We cannot live without it. We cannot rightly discern what the will of God is for our life without spiritual knowledge and understanding and revelation from him. Folks, I don't think we have to beg God to give us revelation. He's already shown us more than we're willing to look at as it is. Amen? All we got to do is just plow off in there and get, get with it, you know. I had a friend who was a pastor over in Chattanooga. And uh, he said, you know, he said, I, he said, of all the things that a pastor does, one of the things that I'm really not good at is counseling people. He said, so I just got a book, a box of Bibles in my office. And he said, somebody comes in there with something, I hand them a Bible and say, yeah, read this. <laughs> Especially if they're a believer, just give them a Bible and tell them to read it. He said, I'm, I'm not a real good counselor. He said, but I know one thing, God's word certainly is. And you know what, folks? I really believe this about God. He wants us to know more than we want to find it out. And all we've got to do is seek his mind and his will in it, and God will grant to us spiritual understanding. Okay? We try to do too much stuff according to the world's way, even in the church. Amen. Even in the church, we've adopted the world's way of doing things, and I believe we just need to get back to the good old book <laughs> and search it out and see what God has to say to us. Another thing that he prays for the Ephesian Christians about is that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know you may be able to see, you may be able to discern what is the hope of his calling in your life. Folks, we always think about, well, so-and-so was called to be a preacher. So-and-so was called uh, into the music ministry, Brother Gary, or so-and-so was called into the youth ministry. Folks, all of us, if we're believers, have a calling on our life. We have, first of all, been called from death unto life. Uh, I got saved not because I was seeking after God, but because God was seeking after me. 
And I can remember, oh, my goodness gracious, uh, I can remember a couple, couple of preachers that we had when I was a young man. I know there was one, he would, every time he got through preaching, he'd be walking on about six inches of his britches leg, and he would be just about as red as these pews, and he could, he could sling sweat for five rows. I promise you he could. Y'all know the kind I'm talking about. And I tell you what, it was under preaching like that that I fell under Holy Ghost conviction. And you know what that conviction was? That conviction was that I needed to be saved. And my argument with God was, well, Lord, I'm only 12. I mean, I hadn't ridden with the hell's angels, and I'm not on drugs, and I'm not an alcoholic, and I, I don't do this, and I don't do that. And the Lord, what the Lord convinced me was, son, you're just lost. You're lost. And all of us, the hope of his calling is this, that he has called us from death into life, from darkness into light, and he has called us to serve him and to be his people. Folks, you don't, you don't find anything any better than that. We are children of the Most High God. Of all the things that we can put down, there's only one thing that can be on our resume that is going to last beyond this life, and that is, what have you done with Jesus, who is called the Christ? That's it. That is our credential. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. That's all I've got and that's all I need. I don't have anything to bring to the Lord. I love the old invitation, just as I am without one plea. But that thy blood was shed for me and that thou bidst me come to thee. O Lamb of God, I come. You know why we, we come with nothing in our hands? You know why? Because we have nothing to offer God. And he has everything in the world to offer us. And Paul said, I just want you to get, get hold of what happened to you when God called you into his kingdom, when he called you into this life that you now have. You know, too many people, <laughs> this scares me to death, too many people say they're saved and act like they got over it. It's not something you catch. It's not something you can get over. It's not something that you can just walk away from. I'm, I'm telling you this, I, I'm, I guess I'm pretty, pretty um, hard-headed about this. I'm so hard-headed I can't even get hair to grow up there, amen. But I, I know this one thing. You can't walk away from God if he's truly in your heart without God pursuing you and bringing you back to himself. If you're really a child of God, he is going to treat you like one of his young'uns. You know, when my, my kids were growing up and I had four teenage drivers in my house and I had a yard full of cars and pickups and things like that, I still had a curfew at my house. I don't care how old you are, and I don't care how big you think you are, because I'm dad, and if you want to take me on, I cheat. <laughs> Amen. Uh, you're going to be in the house when I tell you that you're going to be in the house. And if they weren't, you know what I did? I loaded up and went looking for them. And I just say, listen, if you don't want me to embarrass you in front of your friends, you better just be home when it's time. Amen. I found one of them's car parked one time. He had left his car there. I had a spare key to it, and I stole the car. <laughs> and I hid it, and boy, he was really upset. <laughs> he was even more upset when he found out that I stole it. <laughs> and if I wouldn't let them get away from me. God is so much a greater father than I am. He's not going to let one of his own get away from him either. And he's going to go after him. And Paul is saying, listen, I just want you to understand what happened to you when you got saved. You know what, folks? All the rest of your days, if you learn something new every day of your life, you still will have only scratched the surface 
of what God did in Christ Jesus concerning you the day he saved your immortal soul. Woo, it gets, <laughs> it gets good, doesn't it? It gets good. I'm telling you it does. And uh, Paul says, I'm, I'm praying that the eyes of your understanding being in light, you may know what is the hope of his calling. And he says this, not only that, but I want you to understand what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. I want you to know you've got a lot more than you know about. You've got a lot more than you ever thought you could have because the inheritance of the Lord is everything that pertains to him is mine and yours in Christ Jesus. Everything pertain, that pertains to him is ours. We've got a great inheritance. I, <laughs> I'm always teasing my kids because I don't have that much, really. I don't want any more than what I got. <laughs> but I just don't have that much. And I said, you know what? Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to give you as much as I can of what I have while I'm living so I can just see you be blessed by it and enjoy it. But I said, you ain't going to get rich when I'm gone. <laughs> it's not going to be there, Okay. I'll leave you a legacy. I'll show you how to live for Jesus. But you're not going to have much of the world's stuff. But you know what? Everything that belongs to God, he brings to bear upon our lives as we need it. Amen? He does. Uh, David said this, I've been young and now I'm old. And I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. Uh, he said, the Lord's always going to take care of me. And the Lord's always going to meet my need. And I want you to know something, folks. I have never in my life done without what I needed. May not have gotten everything I wanted. And that's good. Amen. <laughs> Sometimes the Lord says, no, I don't think you need that. I, I, when Chris and I got married, I was, I was feeling my oats just a little bit, you know, and I said, honey, you know, I used to ride a motorcycle a little bit. How about letting me get a motorcycle? I'm still driving a GMC. <laughs> yeah, you could have, that's right. That's right. Uh, no, that didn't, I, I didn't get that. You know why? Because I really didn't need that because I would have hurt myself or killed myself or something in the process of things. But God has never failed to meet the needs of my life, not only materially, but he has met the needs of my life spiritually. Chris had a little episode over the last couple of days. She has problems sometimes swallowing and has to have things dilated and so forth and and she was having some difficulty and she got really concerned got really scared about it and uh, we sat down and had one of those <laughs> it's hard to have a serious conversation with me but every once in a while we we have one you know and she said what are we going to do when something really bad comes along and I said you know what hun I said, I'm not too concerned about that. She said, well, why? And I said, because I'm not there yet. I don't have that grace yet. But when I get there, the grace will already be in place for that. So I'm not going to worry about it. God doesn't show me today how I'm going to make it through something like that when I don't even know what that something is. But when I get there, Nothing ever took God by surprise. Not one time has God ever said, boy, I didn't see that one coming. He's never done that. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the Lord our God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. And no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. And God gives grace for the journey, doesn't he? I'm telling you, he does. 
Dr. Oscar Thompson down at Southwestern Seminary was dying of bone cancer, spoke to the student body one last time as he preached in chapel. And, he's, and Dr. Thompson was a funny man. He said, I've been asking God for grace to die. And God said, Oscar, I don't give dying grace on non-dying days. What you need to pray for is grace to live, and when it comes time to die, I'll give you the grace to do that too. And that's what Paul is saying. I want you to understand what your inheritance is. It's everything that pertains to God. Everything that God has for you, he'll make available to you at the moment of your need, and he will bless you. I'm telling you folks, isn't God good? And he blesses us. Yes, he does. So he said, I want you to understand that. And then in verse 19, he says, and I want you to understand the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. I don't have any power, but he gives us power. Our power is him. It's just like a, 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 some sort of electrical appliance or whatever. I, I finally dug around and found we've got a pedestal oscillating fan. I put that on, out on the back porch. I'm creating artificial breeze. <laughs> <clears throat> Do you know what? It has to be plugged in for it to have power. We've got to be plugged in to have power ourselves. And the Lord wants us to know something. He wants us to know that that power is not of us. In fact, the best thing that we can do is reckon ourselves to the fact that you and I have very little power on our own. We have no power on our own. There was a father who was watching out the window, and he had a son that was out there in the yard, a little boy, and he was trying to turn over this big rock. Now, little boys don't have to have a good reason to turn over a rock. They just want to know what's on the other side of it, right? What might be underneath there that they can snatch up and scare their sisters with or whatever. And this little boy was just straining and everything that he could possibly do to turn this rock over. And the father walked out there and he said, son, what are you doing? He said, I'm trying to turn over this rock. He said, well, why don't you? He said, I can't. And the father said, Yes, you can. You haven't asked me to help yet. Light bulb. <laughs> Light bulb. We can't. Little ones to him belong. They are weak. But he is strong. That's it. The power comes from him. He says... I want you to know the exceeding greatness of his power toward us. With him, the word says this, with him nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. I had not been a Christian very long. And uh, there was a dear neighbor man that lived kind of catty-cornered across the street from us that I love that man dearly. He was no blood relation to me, except I'd just go over there and bug him, you know. I'd see him out working in his yard or plowing in his garden or whatever he was doing, and I'd just go over there and bug Mr. Wilson. I guess I was Dennis the Menace if he was Mr. Wilson, huh? And I love this man. And Mr. Wilson began not to feel very well. He got to looking emaciated and so forth and Mr. Wilson went to the doctor and Mr. Wilson was diagnosed with advanced cancer that was going to take his life. In fact it was so bad it was in his spinal column and they told him don't even bend over. Your spine is like a sponge. It has so many holes, it's riddled with holes. It's like a brittle sponge. It could just break. And I remember Mr. Wilson was a great man of faith. 
and he called his church together. And you know what? Baptists need to do more of this kind of stuff. The Bible says, if any be sick among you, let them call the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And you know what? We need to do some more of that stuff. You know why? It's in the book. It's not for show, but it's what God said. Well, his church family began coming to his house because he couldn't leave. Praying for him. And I remember they had a, a, lot of, a lot of folks back in the day, they had a back room on the house. It had a bed in it. That's where their TV was. And that's kind of where they lived was in the back room of the house. And I remember it being so bad that you could smell that disease. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You can smell that disease. And he prayed. And they besought God on his behalf. And I saw God raise that man up. The next time he went to the doctor, the doctor said, I don't know what's happened to you, but your backbone's like a 16-year-old. There's no sign of anything inside you. And I got to bug Mr. Wilson for a good long, long while. While I was in college, he died in his garden. Not of cancer, but a heart attack when he was in his 80s. And I thought, hallelujah. I got to witness that. We've got a God who can heal the sick. We've got a God who can transform the life of the worst possible person that you can imagine on the face of the earth. We've got a God who can transform that. We've got a God who can lift people up when they're down. We've got a God who can bring people peace to their hearts when they are torn apart. We've got a God who can comfort the grieving. We've got a God who can do anything but fail. Remember that little chorus we used to sing? God can do anything, anything. God can do anything but fail. According to the working of his mighty power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, and he goes on, he, Paul can't help himself. Paul's a preacher at heart. So he just breaks loose preaching here about the power of God. He says that power which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. The power of God is what raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, oh, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come and has put all things under his feet. Woo, he's conquered everything. That's the power that works in us. It is. Ladies and gentlemen, we're not powerful, but he is. We're not great, but he is. We're not strong, but he is. He can do anything but fail. And Paul said, I want you to know these things. I want you to understand that God is the source of wisdom and spiritual revelation. I want you to seek it from him. You know, God will give it to us. I want you to have your eyes open that you may see the hope of his calling and the riches of his glory and his inheritance toward us. And I want you to understand, come to terms with, reckon with the power that is working in you. Ladies and gentlemen, we're blessed. <laughs> we are blessed. This thing called the Christian life is a journey of discovery. Every day, learning more and more about what God has done in Christ Jesus concerning us. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, that yeah, we've got heaven, and I'm looking forward to it. 
And it's going to be a glorious day when we get there. But I want you to know the journey here is okay too. The journey here is good. It really is. Uh, I can't. I can't imagine. I don't know how people live without Jesus. You? I'm glad I don't know. But I don't know how they do. Uh, he is. Folks, he's not, he's not just part of my day and your day. He is our day. He is our life. Uh, everything that we're blessed with comes from his hand. Uh, the fact that, that we made it from this morning till this evening was by his sustaining hand and he blessed us. Amen. And you know what? We wake up in the morning and we put our feet on the floor and we get out of bed. It's been because God has blessed us. If we open our eyes and we can see, it's because he has blessed us. If there is sound coming in our ears, he has blessed us. Uh, all the things that we take for granted on a daily basis, roof over our head, food on the table, clothes on our back, people that we love around us, that comes from his hand. He has blessed us. My goodness, isn't God good? Paul says, I want you to understand what you got. I want you to understand what is yours in Christ. Folks, Brother Bill Stafford used to say this, I've never seen the number of people asking for something else when they don't even realize what they already got. We don't need anything else. We got all that God is, all the fullness of the Godhead dwelt bodily in Christ, and when we received him, we got everything that God is. You're not going to get any more God. The big thing is God just needs to get more of us. And that's called growing in grace and growing in understanding. Folks, we need to live gratefully. Yes, we do. Because we know where the source of the blessing is. You know, I, I make it a practice to sing the doxology every once in a while. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Because they do. They flow from him. Flowing is not just a trickle and it's not a drip. It's a stream. All blessings come from him. So we need to live gratefully. We need to live uh, with anticipation. Lord, I can't wait to find out more about you. I want to learn more about you. Because you know what, folks? Like I said, we can learn something new every day from now to the end of our lives, and we will still have only scratched the surface of what it is to be a child of God. We are blessed. Paul says, dear Ephesian Christians, I want this for you. I believe God wants that for us too. And if we can just wake up to what is ours, ladies and gentlemen, what a blessing that'll be. Amen? Amen. Amen. You don't need something else. You already got him. His name is Jesus. He's the fullness of God. And he is in us. And he stands ready to bless us with every good blessing. So let's be grateful people to the Lord. Let's pray together, please. Father, I thank you that you have blessed us in such a magnificent way. There is nothing lacking. You have given us all that you are. Uh, that is our inheritance in Christ Jesus. Lord, no matter what might come into our lives, we have this confidence that you're going to meet that challenge with the grace that you have set aside just for that moment. Lord, there's not a dilemma that we cannot face with the spiritual knowledge and understanding and wisdom that you want to give us. And Lord, there's not a question that cannot be answered that you're not willing to just pour your grace out on us and show us the way. Lord, I pray that we will just be people who live up to the potential and the possibility in our lives that Christ has placed there 
your power works in us. And Lord, because of that, we have everything that we need and we have all that we need. I ask, Lord, that we'll just live in grateful appreciation to you for all that you've done in our lives. Help us, Lord, tonight to commit to that type of lifestyle where we don't look around and we wonder about what we don't have, where we look at what we do have and we stand amazed at the vast supply that you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together, please.